Welcome to this evening's Tagore Festival, presented under the aegis of the Tagore Programme on Literature, Culture and Philosophy at UC Berkeley. I'm Atre Gupta, I'm an Assistant Professor of Art History, um, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for the day. The Tagore Programme was launched not long ago in the fall of 2020, and it is the first of its kind in the United States. It's designated it's designed to showcase the life and legacy of Rabindranath Tagore. Um, and the program sponsors talks and workshops on Tagore, as well as public events such as this. Uh, our aim is also to fund a semester long visiting professorship in Tagore studies at UC Berkeley. It is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Shiva Kumar. But of course, Professor Shiva Kumar needs no introduction. Many of us know him through a series of seminal books, to mention only a few. Shantani Ketan, The Making of Contextual Modernism, which introduced the term contextual modernism into our vocabularies and has become um, a lens through which uh, many in the art world think of the Shantini Ketan moment. Um, other books include um, Shantini Ketan murals. More recently, he has curated a range of major exhibitions at the National Gallery of Art and elsewhere that have been accompanied by publications of great scholarly heft. These have included retrospectives of Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, Ram Kinkar Baij, KG Subramaniam, A. E. Ramachandran, and many more. For his scholarly contributions to the art of Bengal, Professor Shiva Kumar has received numerous awards, one from Pushim Bongo Bangla Academy, one from the University of Dhaka, one from the Kerala Lalit Kala Academy, again to name just a few. His work on Rabindranath Tagore, of course, is seminal, and I know we are all eagerly waiting to hear from him. Before inviting him to stage, uh, let me just, just mention how the evening is planned. Uh, Professor Shiva Kumar will be speaking for about 30 minutes, and this will be followed by a question answer session with the audience for another 20, 20 minutes or so. Uh, please do submit your questions um, via the Q&A box. Um, with that, I know we are eagerly waiting to invite uh, to hear from Professor Shiva Kumar. So Professor Shiva Kumar, please join me in this virtual stage. So thank you, Professor Arthri Gupta, and thank you, uh, the Berkeley Center for inviting me to this event where I know there are scholars on Tago literature, philosophy, and thought uh, going to address you. And it's a great honor to be joining them in this series of uh, lectures and events. I will talk about uh, Rabindranath's painting, but not so much about the paintings themselves, but how he came to be a painter. Now, certain things are pretty well known, like for instance, that he broke onto the modern art scene with an exhibition in Paris in May, 1930. Now, this emergence of Rabindranath's paint as a painter was seen by his biographer, Krishna Kripalani, as an outburst of creative frenzy at the end of a long career dedicated to literature. His nephew, Abhinindranath, who was leading the Indian art scene at that moment, also saw it as a volcanic eruption. Rabindranath himself appeared surprised. He wrote, what is the meaning of all this when all the different chapters of the book of my life were about to close the presiding deity of my life, I think there was much talk about this presiding deity yesterday, has 
felt pleased to provide me this unprecedented opportunity and the wherewithal for composing its epilogue. So he thought it was an epilogue, but it was also a surprise to him. Somewhat contrary to this view, Mughal Dey, who organized his first exhibition in India, wrote that the paintings of the poet, which have come to light by this time, have a long history behind them, thereby suggesting that his emergence as a painter was not sudden or unexpected. He gives two instances of this. The first is from 1909, when he was a student, a school boy at Shantiniketan. And he says that Tago one day gave him a sketchbook of his own, which contained a portrait of his late wife, Mnalni, and a few other designs and so on. The second instance is from 1914, when uh, Mukulte accompanied Tagore on a kind of vacation to Ra Ramgarh, and where he says that Tagore took his sketchbook, I mean Mukulte's sketchbook, and drew a portrait of his daughter-in-law, Pratima Devi, and two of Mughalde himself. So he was suggesting that he was been practicing it at least till 1914, and therefore his emergence as a painter a few years later is not surprising. And we know that he, I mean, by 1924, he was actively making images, and by 1928, he was actually painting. So Mughalde's view is a little different from that of some of the others. But Rabindranath too has spoken a bit about his early interest in art. In his biography, Jeevan Sruti, you hear that as a boy, he learned, I mean, drawing along with other subjects. And in his mid twenties, he writes about the afternoons spent in pursuing his desire to draw. But he also adds that the most important part of this play was no trace was left on the paper. Eight years later, we again hear of him casting lustful glances of unrequited love, though he adds again, he had passed the age of wooing her. In a few years later, again, in 1900, when Rabindranath was 39 years of age, he writes to J.C. Bose, his friend, where he says that though drawing is the skill that comes least easily to him, and he's using the eraser more than the pencil, but he's engaged in it just as a mother lavishes most affection on her ugliest son. And finally, in 1917, we have him writing in a letter to his daughter I mean, saying that I'm no painter myself, or I might have shown what had to be done. So by 1917, certainly, or by 1900 itself, he says that he's not able, to, he's not a painter, he doesn't have future as a painter. And in 1917, he certainly declares he was no painter. Now, what one sees in all these early recounting of his early efforts at painting is that he saw it as a misadventure. And each recounting of that effort is both a confession of desire and disappointment. So clearly, you can see that Rabindranath saw his early efforts and his final arrival as two separate and distinct events and not as a continuum. Therefore, his early failure and later success both needs some explanation. Rabindranath's first recorded response to painting comes in a letter from 1893, in which he speaks of a morning spent looking at Ravi Verma. The second instance is from 1898, and here he's congratulating the young sculptor G.K. Mathry on the sculpture, which was quite I mean, drew attention of a lot of people at that time called to the temple. And he adds that 
it's more than a sculptural representation of everyday reality. It is the realization of the Indian idol of the female form. So that was considered very high praise at that point. Again, in 1900, the year he's writing to, I mean, his last letter, I mean, where he quoted to J.C. Bose, there he kind of says, he's endorsing J.P. Ganguly, I mean, who was another painter of the time, of and appreciating the effort he was making in combining Indian literary sources with realistic rendering. Now, from all this, we can see that Rabindranath's artistic ideal until 1900 was academic realism. And we also know that there's a book of Michelangelo's, I mean, art and a album of, I mean, Ravi Verma's paintings that he gifted to Abhinindranath when he was pleased with the illustrations Abhinindranath did for his book Chitrangada, that's in 1983. And also we uh, know from the same letter that I referred to, to J.C. Bose in 1900, that his ideal at that point of time was Raphael, the art, I mean, classicist. I mean, so it's quite clear that it is by this ideal that he quotes and he writes about and holds up that he judged himself as an artist or his artistic efforts in the early part of his life and repeatedly, I mean, kind of thought he was a failure in that area. And his later paintings were essentially founded on a rejection of the artistic ideal to which these early efforts were devoted. The shift in aesthetic values to which his later and, uh, or the shift in aesthetic values to which the later emergence as a painter is linked happened at two different levels. At one level, it was the result of conscious actions and its history can be clearly traced. At another level, it was brought about by a change in sensibility that happened more slowly and subliminally, unawares to Rabindranath himself, and therefore the element of surprise and the question, what is the meaning of all this that he asked himself? Rabindranath's initial engagement with art reflected the views and taste of his class and time. The Sodeshi movement and the artistic response to it by Havel and Abhinindranath led him to think about the issues involved more critically and from a personal viewpoint. While he argued that Indians should seriously engage with their own artistic tradition rather than neglect it, unlike his contemporaries, he also believed that this should not insulate them from contact with other cultures. In fact, even in the essay on Matri, he argues that literature and art should rise above paroch the parochial and connect its native consumers with the world. Equally important to him was an artist's ability to engage with and reflect the life of the people beyond one's own class and milieu and with the environment one lived in as well. These were things he had experimented with and found fruitful as a writer in the 1890s. Post Sodeshi, he drew upon his personal experience to critique the new movement led by his nephews, Abhinindranath and Gaganindranath. And having given up his own effort to become a painter, he took upon himself to give Indian art a new direction. Getting Gaganendranath to illustrate his Jivan Sruti or reminiscences in 18, I mean, 1910, and which compelled the artist to look at the intimate physical environment, which he shared with his uncle, Rabindranath, and urging his nephews to visit the family estates, uh, to soak in the landscape and the life of the peasants, and a little later, successfully persuading their students, Nandalal, Shudenkar, Mughal, they to do the same, and inviting some of them to be part of his educational experiments at Shantaniketan beginning in 1911, 
And finally, the setting up of the Vijitra Club that doubled up as a cultural hub and an art school in 1915 were all part of this effort. While these were pointers towards the kind of changes he wished to see, he had no models and no discussion on art forms or aesthetic values to offer. This changed with his visit to Japan in 1916. Both the letters he wrote to his nephews from Japan and the travel diary he published later are full of astute observations about individual works of art and in, of the aesthetics in general, and cultural cross-cultural comparisons abound in these records. He noted that the Japanese painters worked on a more ambitious scale than Indian artists. They were keen observers of nature, but their paintings, he added, are sparse like their poetry and the houses are not overcrowded with things. They cumble our attention with little, but they have achieved a kind of perfection beyond which lies the bane of repetition. Compared to this, he argued that modern Indian art was intimate and modest in scale. Emotional force was its inherent strength, but its potentialities were not fully realized. And therefore, the pro prospect of its growth was also greater. He also noticed other things in Japanese art that were worth emulating. Most importantly, the permeation of beauty into every sphere of life, especially into their functional arts. In an effort to promote these values among the artists of his circle, he got copies of Japanese art made. He arranged for an artist, Rai Kampo, to visit India and teach at the Vijitra Club. And finally, he started the art school in Shantaniketan in 1919 and made transactions between art and life one of its major goals. If Rabindranath's interest in Japanese art was an effort to broaden his perspective by looking beyond the national towards a similar Asian culture under the ages of Pan-Asianism, an inner need for embracing the cultural other was also growing in him around the same period. The first manifestation of this was domestic. It came in the form of his call for engagement with the rural peasantry and their problems. And at a time when this was beyond the concerns of his contemporaries, including the nationalist leaders. As is now well recognized, his experiments in Shantini Ketan were part of this effort. In the sphere of literature where he was himself most active, he was not only willing to accept that he had benefited from contact with English literature, but also acknowledged that engagement with the other as a, as a necessity for stimulating artistic activity. Drawing on the etymological sense of the word Sahitya, he argued as early as 1895 that the function of literature was to create an intimate accord between one human being and another between the past and the, the near. To bond with the other should not reduce world literature into an aggregate of national literatures. And acknowledging the need for differences, he wrote in 1914, in a 1914 letter to Sturge Moore, that such encounters with the unfamiliar and alien creates a bifurcation in your mental system, which is, need, which is needful for a life growth. Now, I mean, you see about 50 years later, a similar idea being expressed by Ronald Barth, who also talks about the need for the other for being remaining creative. He writes the East functions as the other. And we need, at least it is necessary for my intellectual life, a sort of oscillation between the same and the other. What I'm unable to, what I'm able to glimpse of Eastern thought 
through very distant echoes gives me a chance to breathe. For Rabindranath, engaging with the non-Eastern art had the same effect. Inviting Stella Cramrish to Shantinigar in 1921 and getting her to lecture on Western art was the most evident expression of this conviction in the area of art. But uh, Rabindranath's other cross-cultural encounters with art going back at least to 1912 have gone largely unnoticed or unnoticed, partly because he did not comment on them himself. But let us try to sketch this, these encounters briefly. In 1890, during his second visit to England, he visited the National Gallery of London and confided while he was not a connoisseur, he liked some of the works, but not all. The work that he praised in 1890 was a nude by Carlos Duran, primarily for the non-prudish approach to representing the naked human body. In contrast to this, in 1912, although there is no mention of Roger Fry's post-impressionist exhibition, which opened while he was in London, a few months later, we know that he tried to meet Rhoda, who was also in London at that time, and expresses admiration for his style, especially when he notices something similar in Joe Davidson portrait of, I mean, which, I mean, uh, was being done at the same time. Also in 1913, Rabindranath visited the Armory show while he was in Chicago. This brought him face to face with the entire range of modern Western art at that point of time, from early Impressionists to Picasso, Mathis, and early Duchamp. Now, of this visit, his son Radhintranath wrote, it is very difficult to give any wholesale opinion of it because it was such a mixture of things. It is difficult to have any sympathy or understanding of the works of Mathis, or for that matter, the Cubist. But on the other hand, there is Van Gogh and Gauguin and Cezanne, whose things are not only beautiful, but give expression to the masterminds of a new spirit in art. Now, we do not know if Rabindranath concurred with this response, but whatever his response was, it was clear that at least from 1912, that is much before he wrote about the importance of the other to Sturgemore, and before he went to Japan, Rabindranath was looking at modern Western art. In 1920, he meets Nicholas Rorick in London, admires his work. In 21, he meets Joseph Strygoski, uh, the art historian known for his research in ancient cross-cultural influences in art, now somewhat discredited art historian. He also meets Franz Chisek, the pioneer in the study of child art, and of course, Freud in Vienna, and possibly also Jonas Sitten, color theorist, and the initiative preliminary course at Bauhaus, who was also then instrumental a year later in bringing the Bauhaus exhibition to Calcutta. So, I mean, it was largely through the offices of Itten and Stella Kramish that the exhibition came to Calcutta. And people do believe that Rabindranath was the person behind that. In 1921, Rabindranath also visited Bernard Benson, another art historian in America, and which was not a meeting that went off well, and he reports that to C.F. Andrews. And he writes, I questioned him if he knew anything of our Indian pictures, and he briskly said that most probably he would hate them. I suspect he had seen some of them and hated them already. In retaliation, I could have said something in the same language about Western art. But I am proud to say it is not possible for me to do so. For I always try to understand Western art and never to hate it. And he ended the letter by adding, whatever we understand and enjoy in human products, instantly becomes ours, whenever they, wherever they might have their origin. Rabindranath's engagement with what is called primitive art 
is even less recorded. But it should have been equally strong and influential. He should have been familiar with ethnographic collections. He certainly owned books like uh, Ratzel's History of Mankind, Lehmann's The Art of Peru, etc. And he was also familiar with the impact primitive art had on the moderns. He had seen that in the uh, Armory Show. Besides that, his own poems appeared in Durstrom, I mean, accompanied by modern primitivist illustrations. And the magazine also carried works by other Dybrook artists who worked in a primitivist expressionist style. And further, many of the books on such interactions with modern and primitive arts that we have in Shantaniketan were gifted by him. So he was familiar with this kind of work. Rabindranath's silence about his engagement with modern Western and primitive arts suggests that they constituted the cultural other and that it perhaps excited and baffled him. It also did not form part of the discourse of art in his immediate circle, and thus he grappled with it individually and alone. It was a drawn out process of which he was at best only very dimly aware, but its effect was decisive. It created the bifurcation that he referred to in the letter to Sturgemo in his mental system, which he said is needful for all mental growth, or oh, sorry, artistic growth. It brought out the change in sensibility that allowed him to become an artist with goals and aesthetic values that were different from the one he pursued when he first attempted to paint. Further, if you remember his interest in the art of the places he visited and think of his travels to China, to Indonesia, to North and South America, we can trace a trajectory of non-European, non-Oriental art style, connecting the arts of ancient China, Indonesia, and the ancient Oceanic and Pacific region. And visual affiliations with some of them have been noticed by scholars who have written about his paintings. Arguably, Rabindranath is silent about these engagements because it was happening subliminally, but the formation of this sensibility and its becoming a part of his artistic lineage can be traced through the doodles in his manuscript. Going through his manuscripts, we can readily recognize that the emergence coincides with the abandoning of his initial pursuit of art. In other words, as soon as he gave up the conscious effort to become an artist, drawing became a subliminal activity fed by several streams that was not part of his consciously articulated position. Now, let me just share a few images with you to kind of uh, see how this worked. Okay. Uh, just give me a moment, please. I suppose you can see the images now. I mean, this is the kind of art that he admired in the early part of his life. He was the kind of artist that he refers to. And um, he says he's no competition for raffle. I mean, that is what he writes. And obviously, which means this was the art that made sense to him that he thought he should kind of be looking at. And this is the kind of thing he was scribbling in his notebooks at that time, 1892. So you can see his effort was to create a realistic imagery of some kind. And it's by these standards that he's saying that he is no artist, okay? And by 1900, we should think that he really actually stopped doing that much. And you can see by 1905, we see that he is beginning to doodle in this notebooks. But these are the kind of doodles that, I mean, he usually did for quite some time, which you can see that he cuts it off, then 
makes it into a kind of small decorative detail of some kind, but nothing similar to the work he would do later. Okay, And then suddenly you might see in some pages around 1905, you see a doodle which is a little more like an image in a kind of thing. And this continued for a long while till about 1916. This is a year he is going to Japan. So there is not much of a transformation for these, I mean, 10 years. Okay? And then you can see that, I mean, when he goes to Japan, these are the kind of objects that he's admiring there, writing about. I mean, he talks about how beautiful they are and I mean, his desire to, I mean, bring a whole lot of them to India so that he can kind of thing. But of course, he also got some of the screens copied by Arai Kambo and sent to India so that artists could see what they're doing. And he would have immediately recognized that what he was already familiar with in the West had a linkage with these kinds of Japanese things. So just a Clint here. And then he might have also noticed because he was also getting all these journals going around and seeing Art Novo and the kind of, I mean, what it brought not only to kind of thing, to typography, to designing in nature, and then his own signature, which is almost like an art Nouveau kind of um, arabesque, okay? Now, if one has to do this, we can see that calligraphy of this kind required a certain playful yet, yet controlled inventiveness and an aesthetic sense strong enough to transform a written world into an image. Now, Rabindranath does not tell us when or how this passage from writing to image making came about, but there's a passage in Rolla Baths that captures the drawing of the dawning of such awareness quite beautifully. And Bath writes, this is from his preface to La civilization and decreature, and he writes there, even as I reflect on what I should write, I feel my hand move, turn, connect, dive, rise, and often enough as I make corrections, erase, or even obliterate a line. This field expands until it reaches the margins, thus creating, out of seemingly functional and minuscule traces, a space that is quite simply that of a work of art. I am an artist not because I represent an object, but more fundamentally because as I write, my body shudders with the pleasure of marking itself, inscribing itself rhythmically on the virgin surface. It's virginity representing the infinite possible. So one can assume that Rabindranath also felt something like this, post his encounters with all these kinds of Japanese arts and the art novel and uh, which he saw in great number during those early years. Now, around 1920s, we begin to see somorphic forms emerging in his scribbles. Now, these are reminiscent of primitive art and especially if you think about the Maori kind of thing, I mean, carvings, which were reproduced in anthropological texts and of which he was familiar and he himself had books which contained them. So you'd have either seen them in museums when he went there or you should have seen them through books. So we see some similarities. This is around 83, I mean, nine, sorry, 1923, 24, a manuscript of his, uh, play Rakta Karabi, and there are several manuscripts. It doesn't appear in all of them, but there are only in two of them, you have these uh, corrections in the, of this kind where you can notice that it begins to look a little like uh, some kind of primitive art object. Okay? And then just on one page of the final version of Man uh, Rakta Karabi, there you have this image. So you can see here's actually from those, I mean, doodles that we saw in the early part, he has traveled a great deal. Now, once this is done, you can see in the next manuscript he did, Puravi, there is a lot of these things big to happen. 
and they are becoming obviously much more complex. The rhythms are complex. The kind of imagery is complex. You can see it's not like the 1915, 16 kind of thing. It is actually has more spatial quality. The rhythms are more subtle and sophisticated. And you can see that some of them have sculptural volumes. And there are several pages in this man manuscript where the entire text has been erased. And so we can see the it has been completely erased. And I mean, the words have gone and image has come in kind of thing. Now, these were the kind of things that in 1924, Vittorio Ocampo noticed. And she wrote that he played with erasers, following them from verse to verse with his pen, making lines that suddenly jumped to life out of this play. Prehistoric monsters, birds, faces appeared. Now, Ocampo's enthusiastic response also marked the moment Rabindranath became aware of his, the artistic possibility of the doodles. The moment they entered their subterranean flow in his manuscripts and emerged onto the surface. Four years later, we know that he began to paint and many of them carried kind of impressions of his long engagement with modernist and primitive art. This looks very much like a kind of, I mean, maybe a Chinese ancient bronze or something maybe which reminds you of a African sculpture or something that combines the art nouveauish and the, I mean, primitive art objects. And then of course the similarities ends, but you can see they had their origins in both these traditions. Now, such a journey from doodling to image making was a long, I mean, one for Rabindranath, and it also has a long history in art. It probably began with, I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, and you can see two kinds of doodling that he does. One on the margins of his notebooks, where he doodles certain kinds of faces which goes on endlessly and they are almost timeless within their terms, tideless in a sense. They don't evolve in that sense. And the other is the doodling in the sketchbooks, which are essentially kind of, I mean, used to kind of, I mean, stimulate imagination. And there is an interplay of chance and conscious decision-making that you see in these kind of doodles. Now, in the modern period, this has been taken up by artists like Paul Clay and John Miro or surrealists like Andre Masson and um, I mean, abstract expressionists like Pollock and so on and integrated into their art making process where the impulsive and the deliberate meet or as in Picasso, I mean, where in serendipity and constructive imagination I mean, come together, okay. So we have these things. Now, Ash, sorry, um, yeah. Uh, okay, let me get back. And the shared conception of image making where subliminal impulses and conscious elaboration meet was the different, was different from both Western and Eastern traditional approaches to representation. And it is this, I mean, approach to the sub, where the subliminal impulses and conscious elaboration meet in art, that is what connects, I mean, Rabindranath to a lot of these other artists that we refer to. But this would not have happened without convergence of Rabindranath's conscious engagement with modern Indian art as a critical interlocutor and where, I mean, in this area, he kind of uh, the conscious reasoning ruled and he was, I mean, arguing with them on, I mean, grounds of aesthetics on grounds of social requirements and ships and things like that. And on the other hand, his freewheeling encounters with world art, which gradually and subliminally remodeled his sensibilities. And this convergence happened not in a planned manner, but 
through the formation of a network of rhizomatic linkages arrived through many random encounters and uncharted detours. So thank you very much. I hope I have been able to put forward the view that perhaps uh, Rabindranath's emergence an artist had two levels of encounters, one conscious, and which was more related to what he wanted to see happen in Indian art. The other, I mean, more private, more personal, which he didn't share, but which happened at a much deeper personal level and which gradually transformed his sensibilities. And it is the combination of these two things that allowed him to emerge as an artist at uh, the, I mean, towards the end of his career. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a thought provoking talk. Um, there, are, there are already several questions in the QA, Q and A section, but I, but, but I wanted to start off with a thought that was sparked by your talk. Um, you spoke about primitivism and Tagore's engagement with primitivism and his interest in what we now, now call uh, tribal and primitive art. And I'm wondering if you if you could speak a, a little more about um, his encounter encounters in Argentina while he was staying with uh, Victoria Ocampo in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Um, and uh, I ask because some of the letters that he wrote speak of uh, his encounter with encounters with. Uh, indigenous South American art. Um, and so how do these play in with this larger shifting? And, and this is in, during the interwar years. So how do they play in with, this, with the larger shifting uh, space of uh, primitive and indigenous art within the larger global uh, art landscape, which he's already familiar with? Yeah. Uh... Yes, he did look, in fact, he was carrying probably this book on the art of Peru with him on this travel already. He had just received it when he was beginning on his journey. So he's carrying it with him. So that was there. And we know that he looked at the work of some of the traditional artists while he was in Argentina, but he should have done that already. I mean, we don't have records. Like you can see, like even his son who was, I mean, widely traveled both in Europe and America, studied there. But you can see the their way of responding to art in a sense had a certain limitation. So there was probably no one with him he could discuss these things. He was familiar with a lot of things that was happening around him. I mean, for instance, he had the original edition of Kandinsky's, I mean, spiritual in art. And uh, so he was familiar with them. He was looking at it, but he was extremely silent about these encounters. So we can only reconstruct that probably he looked at this and this and this and kind of a thing, and then have to draw our own conclusions. So, and probably he also had this uh, thing that many travelers do that before you embark on a travel to some new place, you try to look up on the kind of art and culture and read up on those things. So Rabindranath seems to have done quite a bit of that as well. So there were things that was accessible to him in India and through his friends, but there were also a lot of things that was not accessible to him through uh, his artist friends in India. And that kind of did, but it was not totally unknown because you have some of these artists later. I mean, he was taking these artists with him, uh, like Nandalal and um, Shurin Kaur and so on, and Mughal Bay and on these travels. So there are also things that during from these travels that these artists then make sketches, drawings of objects of these kinds and sent back to Shantini Kevin. 
So there are also such things from the British Museum, for instance, that we have in our collection, which Shurenkor, while he was traveling with Tago and he visited the museum and he makes those drawings and sensors. So you have a lot of these things which indicate that Rabindranath was already familiar with a lot of this work, although he's somewhat silent on that aspect. Because I suppose that he was not sure how we can integrate that into the kind of art movement he was trying to build up in Shanti. Right. So certainly he was, he knew this, his visits earlier to Canada was there. So there were all these different visits he had and he should have seen them even before. But Argentina was important because I think he had a person with whom he could now talk about these things. We don't have all those discussions, I mean, recorded. Maybe there is more recording of the talk he and Ocampo had about literature, but not so much about art. However, one can assume that while they were looking at these objects, they should have also exchanged ideas about them. So maybe she was one of the first people, but then there before that in 1921, we know that he's talking about Indonesian art quite a bit with, I mean, uh, ethnographers who were working those in those regions when he visited Europe in 21. He had several visits, I mean, encounters and discussions with ethnographers who were working in Southeast Asia. So he had interest in their work. He even at some point thought he might have a little outpost of Shantideketan somewhere in Indonesia. So these objects did interest him, but we don't have exact records, detailed discussions that he had. We don't have those. So maybe even before we went to, I mean, Argentina, there was certainly, I would say, from 1920s at least. And the other thing that I want to bring that when you look at these things, you can see that he might have been looking through ethnographic books, which in those days had drawings rather than photographs. So when you make drawings, they really become a little bit like his doodles. So the similarity that you see between these two things should be actually traced back to ethnographic drawings of, I mean, maybe Maori art objects and so on. And that is where we sort of mix. We look for textual evidences. I mean, we don't look at the images and the sensibilities that these images hold or suggest. So if we do that, then we can trace back to a point before Argentina. And maybe that was one of the high points in this trajectory, which began maybe at least in the 20s. He should have been seeing it much before from maybe from 1890s onwards, but he's engaging with them more consciously, at least from 1920s, early 1920 or 21. And certainly, and as I said earlier, because those uh, poems of his, which, which were published, I think in 1914 or 15, early 15. So, and he was aware of this, I mean, thing happening. And certainly that was growing from that point of time. Uh, so his Jap Japanese visit, we think about it in terms of Japan, but we also have to think in terms of how that gave him a passage into other arts, which were not representational. So I think, so the Argentinian thing is very important because I think Ocampo was certainly one of those people with whom he could have had discussions about the value and the nature of these works. Your response actually dovetails very wonderfully into a question that uh, that has been posed in the Q&A section by Shubhi Choudhury, who writes, could you please comment on if Tago did any works based on Japanese arts? Uh, Tago sent Nandulal both to Japan to learn Japanese art and upon his return, Nandulal did Indian themed Jap arts with Japanese art influence? Did Tago do similar uh, work is what uh, 
Sri Chaudhary is asking. Yeah, I don't, you can't really pinpoint a work and say where it's done. Like I showed a couple of things where you might see similarities within certain kinds of primitive art objects. Not exactly of the same kind, but the general idea that it gets that, that you can have a non-representational form of art which can be expressive. And this was something that a lot of European modern artists discovered through their encounters with Japanese art. Because if you think about European art before the modern period, one believed that without the human form, there cannot be intense expression. And this was an idea that is demolished in the modern period, largely through the encounters with Japanese art and then the arts of Africa and oceanic art and so on and so forth. But you see there's a language, he's actually what I was trying to suggest is there's a language connecting some of these traditions. They may not be traditions evolving in a linear manner, but if you look at the ancient Chinese, if you look at the medieval Indonesian art, if you look at the, the whole art of the Papua New Guinea, that area, and if you look at the West Coast art of, I mean, America and so on, you see a certain kind of language which starts with a linear articulation and then goes on to making certain kind of, I mean, expressive images, that is the kind of language which the journey begins with Japan. So probably in a sense, Japan gave him the key to enter into these areas, to connect these two things, that the decorative and the narrative or the expressive need not be separate. And so unlike, you can see artists like Nantalal, where trained artists, and they are thinking in terms of art styles, of art images in a certain sense. Rabindranath was not doing it. He, at any given point, uh, he had to depend to a certain extent on chance, on serendipity, on what happened. And then he consciously manipulates that. But you can see certain images which you can see has certain echoes of Japanese kind of things may not be a Japanese painting, but maybe a kabuki play. So, and he's also absorbing things from across art forms. So he doesn't like, Nandalal might be looking at Japanese art in a certain kind of isolation, but Rabindranath doesn't do that. So something what he might have seen in a kabuki play might come into the way he does things in his paintings. So this I think is important or when he, he did collect a lot of those Japanese masks and they have entered our museum collection through these visits. So there are all these things then when you look at his mask, maybe you will see, okay, this looks a bit like one of these Japanese masks and so on and so forth. But there are also masks which look like other things from other traditions. So there are things or traces that you can see, but it's not something like, okay, this is like, you can say, at look at Nantalan and say one of his Kirti Mandir things look like one of those things from the medieval Japanese scroll, war scene kind of a thing, okay? The Mahabharata war, I mean, the way he paints it, you can link with certain scrolls of the Japanese. Now, you can't do that with Rabindranath, but you can see these faint echoes coming through and which are memories of different art traditions, which he noticed, and they then come into his paintings. But I would think that he didn't begin as a conscious effort in any of these cases, but once an image begins to emerge, then he might have made those links. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's what I think. This, this, this is very interesting. And perhaps Rabindranath was also engaging with anthropological discourses in his own time. I'm yeah. thinking of uh, anthropologists like Ponchanun Mitro, who was yeah. Rajin Rolal Mitro's nephew, yeah. who was uh, speaking exactly in those terms. Yeah. But we are, we are almost running out of time. 
And so, I'm, uh, so I'm, uh, I'll take this opportunity to pose at least one last question from the okay. Q&A section. Um, this is from Shokti Dash. Um, uh, Shokti Dash asks, can you comment on the effect of, um, Shokti Dash is, is, is a doctor, so he, this is a medical term, Protan, protanopia? Or partial color blindness. Okay. So protanopia is likely the, the medical term. Yeah, 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 term yeah. <laughs> partial color blindness in the complete appreciation and creation of art by Robin Brown. Yeah, uh, it's not my area at all, but I am skeptical of this. I know other scholars have written extensively about this, researched on this, but I'm skeptical of this approach to, I mean, art history and discussing art for the simple reason that we know of totally colorblind artists, totally colorblind, who have been medically proven to be totally colorblind using color. They have a sensibility that comes. So I had asked one of them how he works. He said, I can distinguish colors by tones. And this is something that a lot of our Indian artists, traditional Indian artists did. So it's not impossible for an artist to overcome these things. And by looking at a work of art, we can never go back and find out. Well, if Rabindranath was alive and we could test him and we would have found out whether he was colorblind or not, but it's not really possible to do that by looking at works. And um, artists who may not have been colorblind might not have used certain colors. It could be an aesthetic choice that you can look at the works of Ramkinkar I mean, for instance, and you see that certain colors, he used very little of those. So there are many artists you can see that who has a palette which completely, I mean, doesn't use certain colors. So the case of that, and Rabindranath can be very playful when he says and teasing when he says certain things. If he told, I mean, somebody that I can't see, it doesn't mean he didn't see, but he was playfully suggesting that don't be serious about it. Or when you are taking the, or if he told Rani Chanda, just give me any color you like. But it was also an artistic challenge for an artist. You could kind of manipulate an image and change that image and probably do that. It probably shows a different attitude to art rather than actually a statement of facts. So this whole issue of color blindness, I think is a little tricky. And uh, it doesn't lead us, I mean, ahead, I mean, very much, kind of in understanding Rabindranath's art or understanding any art for that matter. Like, I mean, you can check the early work of Ritin Majumda, the designer who was totally colorblind. And he used brilliant colors in some of his early work and much less color, but still color in some of the later. And he was totally colorblind. And I, can vouch that he could see colors and discuss colors by looking at the tones. So I was looking at uh, some of the old slides of his and he said, these slides have discolored. So I asked him, you can't see colors and how are you telling me this is discolored? And that is when he said, I can understand them by the tones. And many, many, I think artists in our traditional world also understood color in terms of tone. The Chinese, for instance, when they did it black and white, they didn't completely kind of wipe out color from the world, but they translated color into tones. And so it's not a kind of un unusual thing for artists to do these things. Okay, next. There was, there are several very compelling questions in the, in the Q&A section, but sadly we are, we are, uh, almost at the end of our time. Um, I do want to pass on one comment from Stephen Inglis. Um, I think I saw oh, several no. references in the sketches you showed to the First Nation style of art of the Northwest Coast, typical yeah. in books and primitive art in the yeah. early 20th century. I'll be sending you yeah. examples. Um, no, no, okay, thank you, Stephen. I mean, I, mean, I know that are there and uh, there are certain things that scholars often make. I didn't make any specific connection because there are quite a lot of things that one can locate, but I'm sure you're certainly right. I mean, there are similarities. 
Um, with that, we come to an end of a, of a wonderful, wonderful, and such an in intellectually stimulating evening. Thank you so very much for being with us today. I also want to remind our uh, audiences that the Tagore Festival continues up to February 14th. The entire, entire uh, program is uh, available in the website uh, of the festival. So please do join us um, on, on for, for really a wonderful two weeks ahead. And thank you so much, Professor Shivakumar. Um, yeah, thank you very much for hosting me. I, I only wish we could have hosted you in person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>